Good morning all and a warm welcome to the fourth webinar in our free webinar series organized by the University of the West Indies Cape Hill campuses Center for Professional Development and Lifelong Learning. I'm Sonia Mahan from the UE and I'll be your moderator for this morning's webinar. The purpose of the webinar or the webinar series remains the same to expose those of you joining us to some of the tools that we are certain will prove useful in allowing you to recenter, re-equip, and reimagine your professional and personal futures. And also to give you a snapshot of the cutting edge programming available at the Cahill campus, particularly in the Department of Management Studies, and of course, the CPDLL. I'll share more of what's upcoming at the end of the webinar. Before we get started, we are going to follow the, the, the following protocols for this morning's session. The duration of the webinar, each participant will have your, visit, your video, forgive me, disabled and your microphone muted. It will be an interactive session and we encourage you to use the chat facility to the right of your Zoom toolbar to engage with us. Should you be having any technical difficulties, please let us know also in the chat facility. And to get the best viewing experience, I recommend that you use the speaker view. Today's webinar is titled Digital Business, and we are delighted to have with us a colleague, Dr. Gareth Beeston, and a little bit about Dr. Beeston. He's a seasoned digital marketing professional and entrepreneur, having nine years experience working in the marketing field. He has a PhD in social innovation from the University of Southampton, is a marketing strategist for the University of Portsmouth and is managing director of Other World Escapes, an escape room business in the UK. Gareth is no stranger to us here at the Cahill campus. In fact, he's been teaching digital marketing at the Department of Management Studies and in CPDLL since 2016 and has taught courses in innovation and marketing at the University of Southampton. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Beeston. Gareth, it's all over to you. Hello, everybody. I'm just gonna share my screen right now. Uh, yes. Okay, just two seconds. Okay, uh, hopefully everybody can see that screen all right. Yeah, wonderful. So uh, welcome everybody to uh, the session on digital business. Uh, as uh, Sonia said, uh, my name is Gareth Beeston. Uh, I've been working in marketing for a little while, in particular in digital marketing, and been teaching uh, on the course here as well. Uh, I used to run my own agency in digital marketing as well, uh, and now I look more into sort of digital entrepreneurship, how to set up digital businesses, and kind of the most appropriate way to do that. So this um, webinar is going to be talking to how we how we set up effective and efficient uh, digital businesses, how we can create sort of hands off. Uh, business models that don't require a huge labor intensive um, model to be able to set up a business online. How can we make it as hands off as possible to create that passive revenue, that passive income for us um, and to be digital entrepreneurs. So that's kind of what I'm going to cover today. I'm going to talk a uh, little bit more about kind of what the agenda is in just a second. That's just kind of a flavor of what's going on. I'll also talk to uh, about um, how the digital business course uh, coming in next year, how that will kind of be fleshed out and what sort of modules you might be um, studying if you decide to kind of take that course with us at the University of West Indies here in, in Cape Hill, Barbados. Um, unfortunately, um, I'm not in Barbados myself. I am in the UK, so I'm about five hours ahead. Uh, so uh, yes, it is a shame, yeah, unfortunately, but hey, hey ho. Right, okay. So uh, Sonia has already given me a bit of a, given a bit of introduction about me. Uh, but here's another flavour of what's going on. So uh, as as Sonia said, I'm managing director of an escape room business. Uh, just to give you a sense of what that is, it's like a team building activity where you go in. Uh, to solve a series of puzzles and play games and stuff in your family or in your corporate team or however it is uh, to eventually solve a mission, uh, complete a mission by yourselves within a respective time. These are fully immersive adventures. So we have a temple, we've got a British pub, uh, a simulator, all sorts of stuff that we've designed ourselves, all sorts of scenarios where people can go in and, and solve puzzles. Perfect for team building. So yeah, come check it out. 
And as, as she said, I'm a marketing coordinator strategist for the University of Portsmouth and I've been the course leader for digital marketing for a little while here and uh, be going into digital business as well, which I'm looking forward to. Right, so uh, what's happening today? So uh, firstly, I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, why we should study digital business. Why is it really important to us uh, to understand the models, the strategies and the practices associated with setting up a digital business? Why is it important to us? Uh, and how we can better uh, cr create models and practices and processes within our business to be effective and efficient as possible. Secondly, uh, I'm gonna talk about the web, the World Wide Web, without the World Wide Web, we wouldn't have digital marketing, we wouldn't have digital business, it wouldn't exist without the World Wide Web. So I wanna talk uh, briefly about how it all started and who, it, who indeed started it as well, and the people involved as well, in particular with regards to digital business. What are the people involved and, and why are they important to this process? Um, thirdly, uh, I'm gonna to talk to you about various digital business models that we have, uh, business models that uh, don't necessarily exist in the offline world, but can be leveraged in the online world uh, for scalability um, and uh, basically fast production of a particular product. Um, uh, then I'm going to go on to the tech and various sort of web applications that we have available to us uh, that we can leverage and utilize to streamline our digital uh, business practices. Uh, fifth, I'm going to go through the strategy uh, channels and innovation as well. How can, how can we leverage innovation across the World Wide Web to develop a more streamlined and more effective and a more efficient business model um, within our digital business practices? And finally, I'm gonna sum up, uh, we're talking about um, opting for optimization. How we optimize our digital business practices, processes, our marketing channels, how we optimize everything to make sure it's as hands-off and passive as possible. Uh, and then I will just sum up talking about uh, the modules associated with uh, digital business at the University of West Indies. Uh, so you can find out more information about that should you wish. Okay. So uh, you'll, every now and then throughout the presentation, you'll see this slide in green, not this exact slide, but a slide similar to this. It is a question slide. So, um, this green slide uh, will present a, a particular question to you. Uh, and at certain times in the chat, uh, as uh, Sonia has outlined, uh, you can write your answers into that if you'd like to. Uh, and then we can talk about uh, those answers um, during or at the end of the session, I believe. Um, and then it just provides a bit more of an interaction uh, with yourselves um, regarding you know, asking questions, basically. Yeah. Uh, each of those green slides, I'll be on them for about sort of 20 seconds-ish. Uh, I won't time it exactly, to be fair. Uh, but uh, yes, you can write your answers within that time. Okay, so why do we study digital business? There's many, many reasons why we should study digital business, as opposed to uh, business uh, studies as a separate kind of entity in itself, uh, because digital business is is very different from from running a traditional sort of bricks and mortar shop. Um, a bricks and mortar shop is very different from managing a online e-commerce website. So we need to think about them in very very different ways. Okay, different strategies, different channels we're using, different customers we might be interacting with, um, a different style of reach as well. As soon as we're online, we have a global reach. Whereas if we have a shop, we have generally have a local reach. Uh, so we need to think about it from a global perspective, not just from a local perspective. You know, things like culture, things like language, uh, they can massively affect how we design a website and the expectations and norms of, of what the customer is expecting to see on your website. So uh, just a few ideas on why we should study digital business. Uh, digital business, as digital business entrepreneurs, we should be at the forefront of studying new technologies and trends in the industry. What are the new technologies that are coming out that we can actually leverage ourselves to stay ahead of the curve? Things like TikTok, you know, our, our TikTok uh, is a social media, for example. I don't know if many of you are on it, um, but we can leverage things like TikTok to, to, to have a new novel way to approach our customers. And we need to make sure we're always at the forefront of new technologies and trends uh, in order to stay ahead of the curve. Um, when looking at digital business, we need to look at scalability um, as an obvious uh, benefit to us uh, in digital business. 
so scalability enables us to uh, develop a fast a brand faster and quicker than we could in and through any offline channels uh, and we need to think about that scalability and how we might potentially control that level of scalability because perhaps we don't want it to scale up straight away perhaps we need to modify where it is we want to place our business practices uh, and our branding and things like that and messaging to make sure that it's hitting the right person at the right time uh, and in the right place as well um, also new indices and sectors so new uh, sectors and new channels uh, new technologies are always coming out so we need to make sure that we are uh, reading up and, and understanding what new industries and sectors are available to us um, within the digital uh, sector um, also we need to also think uh, always about our revenue as well as a business we're always thinking about our revenue the beauty of having an online business is you don't necessarily need to be there all the time 24 hours a day um, in order to make 24 hours a day sales in an offline business if we're taking sales over the phone or sales in, in person we need to be physically there um, or on the other end of the phone in order to uh, process a particular transaction or a sale. Whereas online business, if we have an e-commerce shop, that's open 24 hours a day, but it doesn't require us to be on hand um, 24 hours a day, luckily for some. So um, we need to make sure that we are setting up processes where if there is a fault, then there is uh, some troubleshooting around that. We need to think about ways around that should there be a fault uh, in the technology um, when you're not there. Um, fifthly, uh, we need to understand how to build an effective business as well. Uh, there are strategies and ways that we can set up a business so it's as, as strategically uh, beneficial to us as possible whilst uh, um, providing a, as limited effort as possible because really we, we want a successful business with as minimal effort as possible. That's, that's kind of the holy grail so to speak. So how, how do we refine that business, business model, refine that business strategy to make sure it's as efficient and effective as possible? Uh, also, we need to think more holistically as well. With the um, advent of lots and lots and lots of social media channels, lots and lots and lots of different websites, um, loads of different channels, our search engine optimization, our pay-per-click advertising, all these different channels, we need to bring them in together to make sure they're as integrated and holistic as possible. We need to cover as many touch points as possible because the customer journey has completely changed. We, I'll go through that in just a second, uh, how it's changed, but the customer journey is massively different from what we expect in an offline environment. And we need to think more holistically about that. Um, there's lots of low barriers to entry as well. Uh, so from a cost perspective, from a time perspective, from a reproduction perspective, we don't necessarily need to invest so much of our time and our money into uh, the business in order to make it successful. There's very different ways to do it, and I'll talk, I'll talk about those as well. And the beauty of it being digital, because you, if you have digital products and digital services, we can sell those products and services over and over again. Think about Netflix, Amazon Prime, uh, all sorts of different kind of online training providers. You can reproduce that content and resell that content over and over and over again because it is a digital product. Right. Next slide. So, secondly, uh, the World Wide Web and people. I'm sure 99.9% .9 of you are on the web. Um, and if you're not, I'm, I'm confused why not. Uh, but uh, yes, um, the web obviously is a massively important uh, technological invention that's happened within the past 30 years. Um, and it's really important that we look at the, the pros and the cons of the web in order to develop our business. Because there, there are cons associated with it in terms of control, uh, in terms of technical faults and things like that, servers going down, etc. Uh, so we need to weigh up the pros and cons and utilize the, uh, the affordances that the web offers to maximum potential. Also, people, because the web isn't just a technological invention. It includes people like you, like me, like everybody, uh, okay? And everybody's contributing to the web in some way. Maybe they're posting on a forum or posting on a YouTube video, or maybe they're actually producing training material, whatever. We need to leverage the knowledge uh, and expertise of many people across the web in order to include that within our business plan. Because not all the smart people work for you or for me. Um, we have many smart people that work outside of 
the boundaries of our organization, but how can we leverage uh, the knowledge and expertise of those people outside the organization within our business model? So, who is this person? It will, it will show in just a second. So who is this person? I'll wait for around 15 seconds, 20 seconds. Let's have a little time. Do, 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 do. Really my hard to fill up. Okay, I'm gonna move on now. I've stumped the audience, Gareth. I hmm? don't have any responses. Uh, I haven't seen any yet. Ah, no, when we have I... one from Nicole, <laughs> Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Oh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Okay, correct, <laughs> Nicole. Well done. So Sir Tim Berners-Lee, he was a physicist uh, down at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, and he was, as I said, he was a physicist down there. And what he wanted to do was set up a HTML system that enabled documents to be linked together. Basically, that's what it was. So because the Large Hadron Collider is so big, they used to cycle around uh, the whole of the thing. They use couriers on bikes to cycle around and pass messages to each other. Obviously, that takes a lot of time. That's inefficient. It's ineffective. So Sir Tim Berners-Lee came up with this idea of linking documents so computers could be linked together and share those documents together. And what it was, was the World Wide Web. So he produced this paper for it. and since then it has grown and grown and grown and the world wide web one of the reasons why the main reasons why it was so popular was because it was free there was lots and lots of other hypertext markup language uh, systems out there that predated the web it wasn't the first one um, however it was the first one that was free a lot of the original ones uh, they were um, very comple complex uh, and they had lots and lots of features and functions that the web didn't have. A lot of people that created these older systems looked down on the web, uh, the World Wide Web, because it didn't have all the abilities of the other, other ones. However, Sir Tim Berners-Lee decided to make it free, and that's the reason, one of the reasons why it became so popular. So nowadays, look at everything we do in our daily lives. It's entrenched in everything we do. We're on the phone when we're commuting to work, on the on the bus um, or on the train. Uh, we're just walking around uh, with our mobile phones. We're speaking to people whilst a mobile phone is in hand. We're watching TV at home, but also our mobile phone or our tablet is in our hands. We're generally looking at multiple screens at the same time. Uh, we're, dis we're distracted by so much content going around about us. It's just, it's just so ingrained in our daily lives. We couldn't really think about a day which we'd be able to spend without it. Um, if we want to know an answer to a question, where do we go? We go Google straight away, um, or a cozier for some people that are a bit more au fait with that. Um, so instead of knowing knowing information, we just instead know where to find the information. We are, we are searching for that information, we just know where to go to it. So it's heavily entrenched with us. It's completely altered how we work and play. You know, we could spend the whole weekend look, watching YouTube videos if we really wanted to, uh, and I'm sure some people do. And also how we work as well. A lot of uh, our practices, a lot of our processes are now stored on the web through cloud servers and things like that. It facilitates us in terms of, um, in enables us in terms of working faster, more efficiently and sharing information. So, you know, a lot of uh, companies are now taking on the whole of the Google suite. Um, and that's purely online. So their email, their Google, their sheets, uh, spreadsheets, their Word documents, their slides, everything they need is online, is on through the web. It connects people, things and data with the advent of smart devices. Lots and lots of more devices are connected to each other via the internet uh, and via their own version of the web. Um, it enables devices to share data across protocols as well for um i'll talk about that later how that helps us in terms of developing a business model uh, a better business strategy uh it's provided as a platform for global reach uh, as i mentioned before as soon as you're online you become a global business um whether you like it or not you are out there as a global business uh, and generally it democratizes uh entrepreneurship because it enables anybody any tom dick and harry down the road susan down the road uh to be able to set up a business in their own time uh, just as easy as a larger organization would be able to as well. 
You don't need a huge amount of money. You don't need a huge amount of knowledge. You don't need a huge amount of competencies to be able to do it. You can do it from the comfort of your own home and in your own time, spare time. So um, to the closest 0.5 billion people, how many people are on the web right now or on the internet, have access to the internet? Just a reminder, you can type your responses in the chat. We'll just give you about 20 seconds to do that and then I'll feed that back to you, Gareth. Okay. okay. The question for us? Uh, the, the question, repeat the question. Yes, sure. So how many, to the closest 0.5 billion people, how many billion people are on the internet now who have access to the internet? <laughs> Shall I move on? Okay, so uh, I'm sure a series of you have responded in there. Um, the actual answer is 4.5 billion people. Uh, so uh, a little over 50% of the world's population, around around 60, 65% of the world's population uh, is Apologies, now. Gareth. Um, I, 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 I didn't realize I was muted and that was the popular response in the audience. 4.5 billion, uh, 4.57 billion. Um, I think wow. one was one of our first ones, uh, but that was the resounding, that was the resounding response coming back. Excellent. Good to know. And two billion, but your audience is right with you. Excellent. You know, uh, I only wish there was 4.5 billion watching this right now. Hey. <laughs> yes. So 4.5 billion. Well done, everybody. Excellent. So um, now we move on to the online consumer. Okay. So this is the people on the web. Uh, this is this is what they do. This is what they expect. So um, the online consumer is massively different from the offline consumer because we have all this data. Uh, all this information available at our fingertips. Um, we are able to um, do product comparisons. We're able to do price comparisons. We're able to do, look at reviews. Um, we're able to look at um, social media recommendations. We're able to look at a wealth of information at our fingertips that we can look at simultaneously. Uh, we, I'm sure many of you have like about 50 tabs on your, on your browser. Um, I, I do sometimes. Uh, you know, we're looking at many, many different uh, facets uh, many different um, dimensions of its products to compare them like for like is this one better is this one not better uh, we're bouncing around a different pieces of information different touch points all along the process so no longer is our process going from uh, potentially seeing an ad in a newspaper phoning up the car garage to buy a car visiting the garage then interacting with that salesperson then making the sale no instead if we want to buy a car we might look at many we might look at social media facebook marketplace for example we might look at um general motors uh, we might look at a different website that sells cars uh, we might compare all that information uh, and compare the quality of the websites uh, and the services that they offer around that purchase as well we might do price comparisons in the cars uh, we might want to do a virtual reality test drive uh, there's loads of different pieces of information that we can grab together to form a fuller picture of what that product is, what it does, how quality it is, and the service, how quality the service is around it. And we know as consumers, we have all that information ready and available to us. So we can use it to, to our heart's content. We can use it as much as we want, okay? Uh, so we are more info, we're more tech savvy, uh, we're more data savvy, we know how to collect data. Some people know how to get, analyze data as well. A lot more um, people with data analytics skills are coming out of the woodwork in particular um, fields such as data science is becoming a massive, massive deal. We have a lot more choice available to us, uh, a lot more niches as well. We can not only buy cars from these big manufacturers like Ford, we can buy mi m cars from mini manufacturers that have created like maybe one or two cars. Maybe it's a local local car that we can only find because it's, it's online. Um, we, we are a lot more resistant to hard selling and advertising these days. The click-through rates 
on advertising, online advertising is well below 1%, somewhere around 0.05% uh, is what we're expecting uh, in terms of our click through rates on our adverts. So it's very, very low. We are just, we just accept the advert is there, but we don't necessarily uh, interact with it anymore. Okay. So us as cotton consumers have massively changed. Which takes us uh, from Gareth, before you continue, sorry to break your train of thought, but Karen had a really good question here uh, yep. that has been directly related to what you said. I'm not sure we're going to capture it later. Uh, why is it only 50% that is engaged? Is it that the others have no internet access? Uh, I didn't catch the full question, sorry. Why is it only 50% that is engaged in online, being online consumers? Is it that the others have no internet access? Yeah, so uh, I mean, we still have around uh, four, three, three point five to four billion people that don't have ac any access uh, to the internet. Some people may have a modified version of the internet as well, uh, because you know government practices and things like that can limit people's view in terms of what they see. For example, um, China, um, you know, they they block certain websites such as YouTube, um, Google, I believe they're doing a partnership with Google and something, uh, but they block, you know, Americanized websites as well. So a lot of different uh, jurisdictions will have different types of access to, uh, to the internet. Uh, so they'll have a very different view. I'm talking kind of generally on terms of in, in general westernized countries, what we have access to, if we have access to the majority of the internet, we generally follow this process but there will be variations, of course. So and just one final question, again, related to just what you were speaking of. Uh, Omar is asking about the click-through rate and that being abandoned. Uh, are you just looking at impressions or and accepting that people saw it? Okay, so um, generally, I, I will talk to this a little bit later, um, but generally okay. with um, online advertising, uh, we need to take it with a pinch of salt. We need to have our expectations really, really, really low. So don't set our goals high in terms of click-through rate. There's two, there's two main goals we want from advertising. Uh, there's awareness and there's acquisition, okay? So with awareness, if we, have, uh, if we are running a display ad on another website, we know that the click-through rate is gonna be so bad that it's almost, almost non-existent. However, it's getting your brand out there onto websites. And if it's placed correctly, it's getting onto websites which have a very similar product line um, or a very similar um, type, type of business. Uh, maybe a blog is writing about cruises and we want to advertise our cruises on that, on that blog. Um, so, uh, you know, awareness is generally our number one goal in terms of uh, pay-per-click advertising. Uh, but we also have acquisition, which is a secondary so if we want to target four click-through rates, we need to put that within our budget. We need to make sure that we are bidding uh, correctly uh, and that we're efficiently bidding uh, for those clicks because it could cost us, you know, uh, upwards of, you know, maybe $10 for a click. Uh, it could do that. Uh, so we need to make sure that our budget is matching uh, expectations of our clicks. Um, so acquisition can be used, but it's generally not kind of the main goal uh, there, I'm sure there are other goals out there in terms of using pay-per-click advertising, but those are the main two, really. Hopefully that answers the question. Okay. Thanks so much. It's okay. Um, so uh, the customer journey. So we're going from this linear, very, uh, very strategic, very um, planned out approach to now sort of like a, a network of different touch points, uh, a web of touch points that our customers are interacting with. So they may bounce from your online shop and then go to your social media page and then go to their friend's social media uh, because they wrote a recommendation about it. Then they might look on their website uh, on their mobile phone to view a video. Uh, and then they might go to Spotify just to listen to music in the middle of their purchase decision. So we as consumers are heavily distracted by loads of different touch points that we can interact with. So we need to make sure that all of our channels are sort of singing from the same song sheet uh, that are as integrated and consistent as possible. Not the same. We don't want to make them the same. Uh, we want to make them consistent. Uh, but each one has their own unique flavor, their unique value that they add to the process. If we are not providing value in all of our touch points, it's pointless having that particular touch point. You see a lot of businesses which will go on and just set up a Facebook because they think they need Facebook. I mean, 
you may need a Facebook, but you may not. Maybe Instagram's better for you. Maybe Twitter is better for you. Maybe even TikTok or you TikTok or YouTube. Um, we don't necessarily need to assume that the channel we've most heard about is the one that we should have. And if we have it and then use it ineffectively, it's kind of damaging your reputation as a brand anyway. So there's not really much point in even having it. You might as well have no Facebook than have a bad Facebook. So that applies to every single channel we're using, our search engine optimization, our pay-per-click, our website, everything we're possibly doing. We want to make sure it's consistent, adds value to the conversation, adds value to the customer journey. Okay, so the online entrepreneur. So the online entrepreneur um, is a lot more, um, there's a lot more there's differences in terms of uh, the online and the offline entrepreneur. With regards to the online entrepreneur, um, all you need is a device. You could set up a business from a mobile phone these days. You can set up a business from a laptop, from a tablet, uh, whatever, piece of, whatever piece of technology you want to use, you could probably set up a business from that. Okay, uh, so it's actually, uh, the online entrepreneur has access to a wealth of information at the fingertips. As a consumer, we, we can get into the consumer's shoes a lot easier because we can trace their steps and go through the process and practices what they might do. Uh, we might want to, you know, do that same process. Go to the Facebook, then go to a friend's Facebook, then look at a review, then go to Spotify. If we get into uh, the process of the consumer, we can better understand how it is they might interact with our brand. With all this uh, wealth of information at our fingertips, uh, we can utilize that within our um, business str strategic uh, decision making process. So we can download data sets, analyze those data sets. We can utilize that data within our situation analysis to understand where our business fits within the market. Uh, we can look at things like Google Trends to understand search terms and how they're trending across the world and across uh, country uh, nationwide. Um, we can understand people's interests uh, on things like Facebook. People are telling us what they like and what they don't like. We can leverage that data, leverage that information to make sure uh, that our business fits with the specific likes and dislikes of our customers. So instead of in the, the old days on offline, um, where we're half guessing what our customers want, um, you know, you can run surveys and things like that, fair enough, uh, but they're not telling you exactly what they want. A lot of people, you know, it's, it's been studied, a lot of people will, you know, lie and, and, and talk about uh, different things on surveys that aren't necessarily relevant to the particular um, objective that you have. Whereas from Facebook, there's no, there's no incentive to lie. They're telling us what they like and what they don't like. So we can we can hone our um, strategy and hone our business processes according to those specific likes and dislikes. So it's a very different world as an online entrepreneur. You've got lower cost, you've got lower efforts potentially, uh, you can streamline your processes, you can all automate your processes and you have a wealth of information available to you in, as opposed to in an offline environment. So digital com competencies and learning. Um, yeah, so uh, it's really important to understand um, our, what we need to know as entrepreneurs, as business owners, in terms of um, what things we, our skills and our competencies, uh, because we can, we don't necessarily need to know anything about web design before we go and design a website. Obviously, it helps to know uh, facets um, about web design. However, there's lots of online web, web creators, website creators that we can utilize, um, most of them for free, uh, in order to make, make a good looking website. Uh, things like Wix, uh, WordPress, um, various other different con content management systems we can leverage that gives us a well-designed website within minutes. We don't necessarily need to know the ins and the outs of how it works. Uh, once we have something, then we can refine it over and over again. Um, if we want to learn things about maybe video marketing, content marketing, social media marketing, anything like that, where can we go? Well, we can go to YouTube. A lot of people nowadays are utilizing YouTube as a formal learning environment. Uh, of course, you can do free webinars like this. Uh, and also uh, you can do things like, um, take part in massive open online courses as well, which generally are free and you can learn about pretty much anything. So all this uh, learning is available to us 24 hours a day and generally for free. 
So we can think about ways uh, in which we can leverage that learning, bring it within our business, and then make more uh, streamlined processes and make a better digital business overall. So I'm going to go through some various digital business models, uh, which I believe are not necessarily available in an offline environment. Of course, you know, um, I'm happy to uh, have people arguing uh, the other case of that, but uh, it's important to understand what these digital businesses are so we can understand how we might leverage them within our own business. Maybe we find a gap within a particular business model that hasn't been yet done. Uh, it can create a new niche, a new gap in the market that we can then fill rather quickly and rather speedily. So e-commerce, of course. Of course you have your offline shop. E-commerce is very, very different. And the reason why is because we have an infinite amount of storage space. If we're selling digital products, we have an infin uh, uh, infinite amount of storage space. If we are running an e-commerce site, we don't necessarily need to hold all the stock in a warehouse somewhere. We could potentially circumvent that and pay someone else to store that for us. So we can get them to fulfill the orders and do all the processes and everything. So we can be as hands off as, as possible. Uh, another beauty with e-commerce uh, in terms of uh, having an infinite amount of storage is uh, we can leverage what's called the long tail. Uh, and the long tail of marketing is basically um, a, uh, a kind of graph where like, up here you have most popular products where everybody wants them. And then down here in the longer tail, they're more and more and more and more niche as it goes down, maybe eventually ending up to one person that likes that particular niche. So at any point in the process in this long tail, we can set up an e-commerce site, which is dedicated to that very specific niche. And if we do that, it, it becomes um, easier to become visible on search engines. Uh, search engine optimization becomes a lot easier, a lot more efficient. Whereas if we are, you know, a, a shoe e-commerce shop and we sell, you know, loads of different Nike trainers and Adidas trainers and things like that, with loads of all the really popular brands, uh, we sit right at this top in the popular brands bit and we're battling against the likes of Amazon and eBay and, you know, God knows who else. Um, so we virtually have no chance in terms of our, because they have huge marketing teams, huge branding budgets, and we, d we can't even compete. However, if we sit in this niche long tail, we can get more visibility, more quicker, and then do cross-selling and upselling. So we can bring in on the niche products and then sell the more po popular products that way. So e-commerce is really interesting and it's becoming a huge thing. Uh, lots of free online e-commerce and e-shops uh, available, e-commerce builders that you can go out and build in your own time. Just look for a niche, find that niche, and research it as much as you can, research the best products within that niche, and then sell them through an e-commerce shop. So that's something you can do online. And you don't even need a website per se, you can just have an e-shop. Uh, digital products, so things like music, like video, uh, like e-learning programs that you wanna sell, anything which can be created over and over and over again and sold over and over and over again, uh, without without any extra effort from you. So for example, if we sell a video series online and you have to subscribe to have access to that, um, we can have a thousand subscribers or 10,000 subscribers, but it's no extra effort on the part of the entrepreneur or the digital, uh, or the digital business owner. Okay, but if we are running uh, an e-learning program in an offline environment, you know, you need you need a tutor there uh, to, to talk you through the process. And then they need to run multiple sessions and there's a finite amount of people you can fit in the classroom, et cetera, et cetera. So in terms of scalability, when we compare an e-learning program, um, in an offline environment, we're, we're very bound by physics uh, in terms of the size of the space uh, and physics of the tutor and the instructor. Whereas in an offline environment, you can produce, uh, an online environment, sorry, you can produce this video content, these e-learning materials in advance, and then redistribute them and resell them as many times as you'd like. So digital products is becoming really, really important, but it's really important to, to um, remember that there needs to be a series of value associated with the digital products, because if there's no value there, then people aren't generally gonna buy it. Um, another thing is the sharing economy. So the sharing economy is represented by the big boys such as Airbnb and Uber. Um, these sharing economy, th these leverage the sharing economy model, which is effectively a network of uh, a particular property 
a type of property or an asset uh, that brings in uh, consumers and everybody who have micro business, they can bring them all together into one place uh, to then basically facilitate them finding leads uh, to, uh, to, to buy that product or service. So if we take Airbnb, for example, uh, you know, it has thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of properties on there. Um, and, you know, everybody, every cut, every um, landlord that's on there uh, can charge rent for an unused room or an unused property or things like that. Um, so what the sharing economy does, uh, it enables us to, to link people who um, have properties with people that want to find properties. Um, and we need to think about ways in which the sharing economy can be done in different ways. I'd heard about uh, an app, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but basically uh, you can go on this app and it tells you where people are cooking locally. So if you're traveling and you want to experience local food with locals, uh, there's loads of different places where it says, oh, we're cooking now, we're cooking this particular um, meal and you can go there and you can pay in advance and go there and visit them and uh, and sort of like create that sharing economy. Uh, so basically anyone uh, that has a particular asset, they can then utilize that and create their own micro business utilizing these platforms. Um, another thing is lead facilitation. Uh, so lead facilitation is basically a way to marry up, um, marry up customers uh, with people who may have a particular uh, product or service available to them. Maybe they don't have the, the funds or the effort to be able to try to set up their own business and, and work on their own. Uh, so uh, any van is a great example of this, uh, where basically anyone moving house or wanting to move properties that don't have access to transport um, can post a job onto this uh, platform. Uh, and then van owners, uh, people that have a van but they don't necessarily do anything with it in their spare time um, they can help people move house they can bid on those jobs and then the cheapest uh, bid um, generally gets selected by that customer who put out that call for um, uh, moving house or whatever so it's a way to um, you know firstly the customer is happy in terms of they found somebody that can help them move house secondly the van owner is happy in terms of uh, being able to utilize that van where it may not get used so they make a bit of extra money in their spare time uh, and thirdly the uh, the network itself earns a commission on all those transactions as well basically just for marrying them up so once they do have this uh, service this website available they don't really need to manage those processes anymore all they need to do with if if something goes wrong um, so lead generation and lead facilitation models is a good way to do it as well um, and then we have affiliate marketing. So affiliate marketing, uh, in a nutshell, is if we have a blogger or a website owner that blogs about a particular, say they blog about cruises, for example. Um, they've been writing blogs about cruises for a couple of years, and they can approach um, affiliate marketing programs uh, ran by p and Cruises or Cunard or whoever, um, approach them and show, this, this is my content on here, um, I would like to start promoting your cruises um, uh, for um, on my blog. Uh, so the the merchant p and Cruises over here uh, will look at the blog and will vet that website to see how their uh, how their content applies and whether it's relevant to their particular brand. Does it fit the tone of voice? Does it fit the tone of style? Um, we'll vet that content. Uh, we'll look at it in depth and then go, uh, okay, yeah, they are suitable for our program and send over a load of creative advertising, display ads, text ads, all sorts of stuff. And that blog owner can then put those onto their website. And what happens is anybody that clicks through from that blog article, uh, through that advert goes directly to, uh, via the affiliate network, directly to p and Cruises website. If that customer makes a purchase, then that blog owner gets a commission off that end purchase. Uh, so it's a really nice way for people that are, you know, really into uh, particular topics or particular subjects to be able to write about whatever they want about it, but also make money, passive income on that, on that particular um, blog or that article, whatever they've written. So affiliate marketing is a really nice way for, for blog owners uh, to, to basically make money, to, to monetize it. 
uh, influencer marketing is quite a, a key thing. Um, I mean, you do have things in an offline environment called like the celebrity endorsements and things like that. This is similar in a way, um, but instead of just putting a face to a particular brand or a product, instead the influencer is having an active involvement in the promotion of your product or service. So um, if we are, let's use P&O Cruises, for example, why not? Uh, and we find that, you know, uh, someone from a really famous band um, is Blink-182, for example, <laughs> is the example I can think of. But the, drum, the drummer from a band called Blink-182, um, he, he likes to go on cruises all the time. Uh, I know this because I used to work in the cruise industry. Uh, he likes to go on cruises all the time. So you can approach him as an influencer, look at his social media following, and we can go, oh, okay, if we send him free products or incentivize him in so, some other way, we can get him to shout out about our particular cruise and sell them on our behalf. Um, what we do with the influencer is make sure that they are posting out content that is natural, that is organic and original, that it's not an obvious advert. Instead, it's them posting their own opinion about the product and then providing backlinks to us. So it's a lot more of a soft sell. Uh, it's a lot more getting um, an external opinion to really speak their mind about a product or service. So influencer marketing can be a really good way of, of creating a digital business. Um, okay, so next green slide. So what does SAAS stand for? Gareth, Omar, Kemi, and Keith are in on it very quickly. Software as a service. Yes, exactly. Software as a service. Yes. Uh, so software as a service is a really neat uh, sort of version of a digital product that we can have. So once you've created a piece of software, you can sell that over and over and over again. Um, I think, you know, one of the earliest types using this SaaS model was um, Skype, for example. And what they do, um, software as a service um, companies, they set up, they generally utilize what's called the freemium model. And the freemium model is where the majority of people are accessing a bare bones version of that software for free. Okay. And then you have a small percentage of people using tier two and tier three, um, small percentage of people who are paying for the product, which basically uh, facilitates uh, the growth of that product. Uh, and they, they allow it to keep on going. They keep it going by, by in terms of paying for it. We can't expect everybody to pay for it because they won't. Um, but we can utilize methods uh, and tactics once they download the free version of it, we can then cross sell to the, to the, um, the paid for versions of it. So I'm sure a lot of you uh, use software as a service. Perhaps you didn't know it was a software as a service, um, but it is a really neat way to um, sell a particular product over and over and over again. Um, browser extensions, um, likewise with apps, apps were the biggest thing, you know, sort of 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you know, everybody needed an app. Uh, and now we don't really. Um, if you create an app, you're pretty much lost in the ether amongst the tens, if not hundreds of millions of apps that are out there. How do you get noticed? How do you get put into the, you know, top 25? Us as consumers and customers these days, we're, we're, we're very, very rarely using um, apps anymore. Um, I mean, just out of interest, how, how many apps would you say you use on a daily basis? Um, not including the ones that already come with your phone, ones that you've downloaded, just, just in general, just interested. Um, see, Shelly Ann saying two, Nicole says four. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So two, four. Yeah. Yeah. And four, one or two, three or four, WhatsApp, email, and so on. Exactly. So, uh, I mean, email, yeah. I mean, it could be argued that's an existing phone app. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're using very, very, very few apps these days. Before, we'd have like 10, maybe 20 different apps on our phone. Nowadays, we probably have just a handful of ones that we use all the time. If we download an app, um, we might we might delete it after half an hour or we might delete it after a day where we haven't even used it. 
Um, a new way of presenting kind of applications uh, would be presenting, uh, having a browser extension. Uh, so browser extensions is generally free. I think you can charge for them as well. Um, but they are downloaded onto the, onto the browser, obviously. So things like Chrome will have browser extensions. You can download them within there and they can produce a valuable service on demand in real time uh, during your browsing session. So for example, one browser extension I use is called Honey. Uh, Honey is a way to, uh, when you are at the cart of a particular um, e-commerce shop or something like that, it will, um, you press the button and it automatically apply as many voucher codes as it possibly can find about that particular company and see which one gives you the cheapest. So Honey is a really good way to do that. Um, and many, many different uh, browser extensions are available to you to add that service, get that branding out there. And then once you have that branding out there and through value, you get an increase in reputation, increase in loyalty, and eventually you can cross sell other products. So it could be a new channel for you to use if you have a value, uh, value you can add to anybody's browser um, sessions. Okay, so that was quite a quick run through. Uh, we also have various tech and web applications we can utilize as well. So, IOT, I'm just interested, again, um, does anybody know what this stands for? Internet of Things. <laughs> yes, exactly. So the Internet of Things. So the Internet of Things is connecting people, connecting data and connecting things. And what do we mean by things? We mean smart devices. So this could be a smart watch, a smart TV, a smart mobile, etc. Uh, there's lots and lots of different new products and technologies that are coming out, smart cars, um, smart fridges, smart cupboards, you know, everything is becoming smart. And now in the UK, they're building, or they were building, smart motorways. Um, I don't know how we can, whether we're going to have access to that data or not. Hopefully we could. Uh, but we're utilising all these smart different devices that are collecting reams and reams and reams of data. We need to pull that all in and to create uh, a very efficient and effective uh, business model. We can, use, we can leverage loads of different devices that we never thought we would be able to before. We can leverage them more and more and more. So as we uh, look at new trends, new technologies, things like virtual reality, augmented reality, and things like that, um, as, we, as we start to leverage those new technologies, we can then bring those into our business model to make sure we are at the forefront of our particular sector or industry. Um, of course, social media. Social media is a massive one. Um, it can be difficult to control our social media, but think about ways in which we can sort of be adaptive with our social media. So channels, channels are changing all the time. Uh, as I said before, we don't want to just go, let's go Facebook. Let's get a Facebook. We need a Facebook. Everybody, you know, a lot of people says that, um, you know, uh, we, we don't necessarily need a Facebook. Um, new channels are coming in all the time that might be more specific and more associated to your particular niche okay if your uh, particular product line is suited to people in their 60s for example you may actually you may actually um, find that uh, twitter is a much better um, channel for you because the demographics of each of the channels is changing rapidly you know on facebook um, you, do, you don't generally get people in their teens so much anymore. Instead, they, they want to be on Instagram and they want to be on TikTok, okay? So we need to think about ways how the dem demographics of each of these social media channels are changing, keep up with those trends, and also maybe introduce new channels and new, new social media channels uh, when it calls for it, um, as it may be more effective for us and maybe more hands-off. Managing a Facebook profile is basically a full-time job if you're doing it properly. Uh, same with an Instagram profile. If we choose and just run in and go for four social media channels, we're running four full-time jobs and potentially it, it's just you working in that business. So how can you manage four social media channels and do more effectively? You, you effectively can't, you can't do it. Um, so by amount of users, what's the largest social media channel there is out there? Bonus points for anyone that, that knows the second. So Carrie Ann says YouTube, Paula says Insta Instagram, and Glenn Roy says Facebook. Okay, so Facebook is the number one currently. 
Can anybody name the number two? Instagram, unfortunately, is not number two. I think it's number three. WhatsApp is second. WhatsApp is, is I think, I, it's third or fourth, yeah. This is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a curveball, this one, because you, know, you don't expect it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so we had down. WhatsApp, and Twitter is coming in, and TikTok is also coming in. Yeah, so unfortunately, none of those are the second, according to the stats I looked at the other day. So it's actually a, a channel called WeChat. And WeChat, probably half of you have never even heard of. Um, but WeChat is that the is, Chinese one, Garth? It is. It is the Chinese one. So and that's what was in the chat, the Chinese one. <laughs> <laughs> I was it. Okay. <laughs> well done for uh, whoever that was. Excellent. Yes, WeChat. So WeChat is actually second in terms of users. Obviously, the huge population of China uh, helps that, helps boost that. Um, but it's really interesting. If we're hitting a Chinese market, we don't necessarily want to be on Facebook. We might want to be on WeChat instead. Uh, or QQ, which is, I believe, is their version of Facebook. Uh, right. Okay. So, uh, technology is available to us as digital business owners is automation. So we can automate a lot of our processes. Um, some of you may have heard of our uh, marketing automation and marketing automation is a really, really key thing to include in a business model. If we want to be as hands off as possible. So for example, mar marketing automation, one example of that is, uh, nurture, nurture marketing. And if anybody knows what nurture marketing is, it is it's generally done by email, uh, but you put people into a particular nurture campaign. And what you'll do is you'll pre-write a load of emails um, in advance of putting them into that uh, customer journey. Um, those emails will be segmented maybe once every two weeks, once every three weeks, however, however frequently you want to post them out. And what we will do is it will encourage them to slowly is it will slowly encourage them to go down the funnel. The more touch points we have with our customers, where we're providing value every single time, maybe we're providing a how-to video, then we provide, oh, what's their friends looking at on social media? I don't know. Uh, and then we provide an e-book, then we provide an e-magazine or something like that. We're providing value all along the time, but we're not saying, buy this now, buy this now, because it's not going to work. It's not going to be as effective. The more value we're providing in the process, oh, there was a, Okay, don't know what that was. Um, but um, the more value we're providing in the process, the more likely they're going to make that sale at the end, that purchase at the end. Because remember, as, as online customers, we're a lot more averse to advertising and, and hard selling. It doesn't work anymore. We need to get involved in the conversation where we're providing value at every point. Marketing automation can help reduce the workload associated with providing that individualized um, um, content. Uh, because we're not segmenting our audience anymore uh, you know if we group to get people together in their 20s uh, or in their 50s not all those people think exactly the same way so why did we do it in traditional marketing methods we had everybody in their 50s let's target them in this particular way where it doesn't work so much anymore you know there's many many different a broad um, depth uh, broad and deep uh, different kind of opinions in people in their 50s as opposed to you know people in their 20s so we need to think of every single customer as an individual and tailor that content according to what they want, uh, what interests they have, what dislikes they have. We're tailoring every single piece of content to them specifically as an individual. And we can do that via marketing automation. Refer a friend is a really key feature um, of really successful websites and apps. Um, so the most successful but one that I'm aware of is Airbnb. Uh, so Airbnb, you know, if if you if um, some uh, maybe a maybe someone that's a tourist is on there, uh, they can refer a friend and they can actually get money off their next um, Airbnb uh, stay uh, for referring a friend. If that if that friend comes in, uh, then they get even more money. Okay, if they refer a friend and that friend becomes a host, they get even more money, they get even more discount. So there's lots and lots and lots of benefits for both people in terms of um, refer a friend scheme. So, so when we have uh, a refer a friend scheme, generally we want to make it two way, a two way referral system. What this means is both the inviter and the invitee are getting value, discounts, promotions, whatever it is, as a result of that referral system. Okay, that 
basically encourages the, the inviter to want to do it because they'll get something for it. And the invitee encourages them to bring, to be brought into the system because they are provided with a promotion or a discount or whatever it is. So marketing departments and advertising departments, generally kind of the budget is starting to be reduced because we are leveraging customers as advocates for our brands. They're telling people about our brand anyway. Uh, and they're targeting people that they think would like to use our, that, our service. So they're doing our, they're doing our job for us. All we need to do is moderate that process and make sure it's working as efficiently and effectively as possible. So we can automate all of that. Whereas in an offline environment, you know, they could tell a friend, but there isn't necessarily an incentive uh, for them to tell a friend and then come back. It's a bit harder to manage a process where, you know, you get discounts for referring a friend and stuff like that. Online, it's all automated. All we need to do is manage the process and moderate it to make sure it's fully functional. Virtual reality. Virtual reality, um, along with, you know, Internet of Things, IoT, uh, is massively becoming a huge, huge kind of pull. We need to think about ways in which we can, you know, maybe promote ourselves within the virtual space. So not only are we on a screen, we're actually in the virtual environment. Um, you know, things like um, football or soccer games that you may play in a virtual environment. You know, you see all that advertising on the side. We can actually advertise within within there. Think about ways in which we can get our business not only in the digital environment, but in the virtual environment. We're really reaching out to people on an individual basis then. Uh, so think about that. It could be a new gap in the market, a new piece of tech that we can leverage uh, in our digital business. Augmented reality. I'm sure a lot of you have um, used augmented reality in some form or another. So one app that was obviously very popular was Pokemon Go that utilized augmented reality to hold up their phone to then show that Pokemon in the real environment sort of overlaid um, by the digital uh, interface. So it interfaces the uh, augments, the um, digital with the real world. And if we look at this example on the, on the slide, we can hold up our phone and we can get directions to particular shops and particular services uh, around us um, in, in real time. Uh, reacting to what's in front of us right there. So can we utilize this uh, in terms of local local marketing? Uh, so put our restaurant or whatever on this um, platform and you know provide directions to, to it. Adding that little piece of value rather than an advert uh, makes a key difference. Advertising doesn't give us value, um, whereas valuable content marketing provides that kind of value um, to us. Uh, of course, the cloud. Uh, the cloud is a big thing. Um, so, like, we'll, like you see on the on the big screen there, you can see uh, just the long tail. How, that's the graph. Um, so, with the cloud, uh, we have an unlimited amount of storage available. So, we can put on as many digital products as we possibly can, even stomach. Or you can put on as many as we want to. Um, I mean, look at the Amazons of this world. They were able to do that because they can expand their storage as much as possible. Of course, they needed warehouses eventually to be able to store their product and ship it out as quickly as possible. Uh, but, you know, think about a digital business. We can circumvent that, not own our own warehouses, have someone else do it and have a courier on hand to basically fulfill those orders for us. So we're automating that process and we can have as many niche products as possible or just general products as possible. So the cloud enables, enables a lot more niche forms of marketing and uh, digital businesses um, and digital products. So enable us to do that. So uh, fifth section, uh, I'm gonna go through the strategy, uh, some channels associated with it uh, and how we might uh, use, utilize innovation and utilize the web uh, to encourage co-creation and co-innovation um, on, online basically. So um, when, creating a digital business, the first thing I would suggest we do is obviously do a ton of research around that particular sector or that product or whatever it is you're, you're doing. Um, then we want to get to some form of MVP, which is a minimal viable product. This minimal vi viable product uh, is basically a way in which we can put minimum effort into the, uh, the business to test it in the market, gather data back for it, 
And through that data, we can better understand the specifics of what people are expecting from a piece of software, for example. We can test it in the real market. If people aren't using particular features or they don't find them valuable, then we can take them out. We want to make it as lean as possible. The leaner we have the business model, the leaner we have the product or the service or whatever it is, uh, the less um, the less man hours, the less labor we need to inject into our overall business. Okay, so once we get to a minimum viable product, we can test it out into the market. Um, so it's basically the most rudimentary bare bones foundation of a solution. So we need to find, uh, do we have, are we looking for a pain or a gain? Okay, are we a pain or a gain? Uh, if we are a pain, we're looking for a particular solution to a problem that's out there in the market. Okay, from our research, we can understand where pain points may be. Uh, and we can fill the gap that way. Or are we a gain? Uh, gains are generally kind of in entertainment. We're providing an additional value to something, but there isn't necessarily a problem associated with that uh, particular industry. We may provide uh, an ad just added value. Okay, so there may be a solution to a problem or added value. That's what we want to do. I mean, we'll make sure our MVP is doing either one of those things. If it's doing neither, it's not an MVP. Okay. So all along our digital business, digital marketing processes, finances, whatever we do, we want, because we want to be as hands off as possible, once the business starts running, we need to think lean. We need to think lean strategically. So how can we minimize our effort on every single one of our channels, uh, minimize uh, our time associated with the creation or management of those, um, but still have that MVP on every single one of our channels. Um, the, for example, again, I keep leaning back to this. If we have four or five social media channels and we're doing maybe a couple of them well and the rest are not very well at all, um, we need to go back and revisit that and, and say to ourselves, okay, hey, like, is it even worth having these three extra social media channels? They're not really doing anything for us. They're not adding any value. Why not focus all of our efforts on these two that are doing well for us and then we can actually manage more effectively. And we can dedicate more time to those particular social media channels, okay? Same with the website. We don't wanna make it super complicated, clean, efficient, um, consistent design uh, that is as lean as possible. If we, want, if we sell one product, we wanna make sure it's viable from the, from the first page that they see. The less, the less um, stages they need to go through through your website in order to get to the product page, the better because we want to put it there, we want to put it upfront and ready. Okay, so this is kind of the lean thing. Always think lean in terms of any business practice you're doing when developing a, business, a digital business. When we are conducting digital business, uh, we need to think mobile first. And this is extremely important uh, because there's a certain percentage uh, of um, customers that are utilizing, uh, accessing your products and websites um, as minimal, uh, uh, minimal? Uh, on their mobiles as opposed to desktops and laptops and tablets and things like that. So um, one thing we need to think about when we design a website, for example, we need to think about responsive design. And what responsive design is, is a way that the website reacts to the size of the screen that, is be, that the user is uh, using. So um, the website might look different on a laptop as it does on a tablet as it does on a mobile phone screen, we need our website to be able to work on every single device possible, okay? As many as possible, because that gives us the biggest reach. So if we, we, we used to have mobile websites um, about 20 years ago-ish, we used to have mobile websites which were specifically uh, designed for mobiles. They weren't, they generally weren't very good. Uh, sometimes an M dot, something something in the URL or mob dot something. Uh, most companies have done away with that because it means, because with a mobile website, it means you need to have two versions of that site. And there's, you don't really need two versions of that site. With responsive design, it's one version of that site that just reacts to the screen size that's presented in front of them. Okay, so we need to think responsive design, we need to think mobile first, because most people are accessing by mobile. Okay, there's a question coming up. So, what percentage of traffic is on mobile as opposed to tablets and laptops? S 
So Pamela is all first followed by Carrie Ann. Pamela is saying 92%. Carrie Ann is saying 95%. And uh, Nicole, we're saying 70%. Crystal and Glenn Roy saying 80%. Okay. Um, yes, I mean, they're very high. So that's in terms of um, how many people use it overall. Um, yeah, so um, in terms of, sorry, I, maybe I didn't pose the question quite correctly. Maybe uh, it's around um, what pe people prefer to use over other devices. I'll let you have another go. Um, so what okay, percentage do you prefer to use mobile devices over others? Okay, Stephanie is saying 65%. And mm -hmm. Jacintha is saying still 90%. And we had a 70% from earlier as well okay yeah so uh so um from the data that i looked at uh, generally uh, around 51 to 53 percent of your audience is coming out coming via mobile devices as opposed to laptops and tablets uh, that's still of course over 50 percent of our traffic that's why we wanted to think uh, mobile first of course a lot of people will be using their mobile devices um but um, it is over that 50%, so we need to think mobile first. But yes, yes, I'm sure 90% I'm sure of people will use their mobile phone at some point to access the internet and, and, and whatnot. Um, but 50%, around 50% of people are um, accessing it in this way, firstly. And before you continue, Gareth, uh, yeah. Omar was asking, should we then focus on mobile-friendly um, web applications instead, since there's so many, since there's so many apps and web extensions that don't work on mobile? Yeah, so, um, so yes, so there's this, they, for a while there was this debate between responsive design over apps. Should we have an app version to make sales or whatever? So, so, so maybe that app is like a version of your e-commerce store selling a product or something like that. Um, so what uh, apps do, uh, you generally design it for iOS or you design it for Android or you design it for Windows, you know, you generally have to pick which system you're going to design it for. They use different language, uh, different programming languages, et cetera. Uh, in responsive design, it, none of that matters. You, with responsive design, uh, basically it's applicable to every screen size and every device imaginable, really, because it is responding to that particular device size. An app, you need to create it uh, fundamentally for that. And then you need to do marketing around getting that app noticed so people can download it, um, which can be a lot of effort. Uh, with responsive design, we need to make sure it's as streamlined, as clean, as crisp as possible. Anybody using mobile devices, um, they will have smaller screen size in general. Um, so maybe we need to make the buttons bigger. The text needs to be uh, appropriate to the size of the device, etc. Okay. So yes, generally we we'll want to pick responsive design over any apps these days. Um, as it goes without saying, when you use things like Wix and WordPress and stuff like that. Um, they will be uh, responsive by default. They'll be mobile first. Um, so if you use a CMS content management system, like one of those, they'll automatically give that feature anyway, because it's, it's required these days. You know, if you don't design your website to, to work well or look good on mobile devices, you're missing out on 50, 50 to 53% of your audience, which obviously is a huge chunk to miss out on. All right, so um, in digital business, one thing we need to absolute master is our search engine marketing, okay? We need to know how Google's algorithm works. We need to know how Bing's algorithm works, how Ecosia's algorithm works. We need to know all the facets and features and functions of each of those algorithms um, at, to be able to get as visible as possible within search engines. If we're, um, if we're doing, you know, if, we, if we're thinking about it, where, where the first people go when they're trying to find out a piece of information? Where, what's the first, just, just general, I'll ask you guys, where do you go first if you want to find out something new or piece of information? And uh, every, well, Google is the, is the number one answer um <laughs> news channels like bbc news and so on but google comes out and leads the pack and yeah. Omar said youtube yeah i'm glad you said that otherwise uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah <laughs> that would have been a failed experiment otherwise wouldn't it anyway <laughs> so uh, yes 
at Google, number one, in, in any uh, English speaking country, uh, in general, Google will be the number one thing. Um, in China, obviously they have a, their own kind of set. Uh, Baidu is their, their most popular version of a search engine. But uh, in Google, yes. That's why we need to master Google's algorithm. We need to know exactly what it's looking for, leverage that as best of our ability as possible. So search engine marketing could be course in and of itself. Um, it's a huge area which requires a lot of effort, but there's lots of different things we can bear in mind. All I can say is if you are creating original content, utilizing keywords associated with your brand, where you're adding value to the conversation, a value to the customer journey. If you're hitting those three main points, then you should be winning. Okay. We don't necessarily need to tailor all of our content and, you know, do everything we can to fit Google's algorithm. Google looks to originality as one of the most important things in terms of search engine optimization. So if we have original content, which is valuable, then Google will generally rank it higher. Um, aside from that, there's things like link building strategies and stuff like that we can utilize. Um, I mean, I can, I can talk more about that in the question section. I'm not gonna go into great detail about it right now because obviously we're strapped for time. Uh, but we have in search engine marketing, we have SEO and we have PPC. So SEO, search engine optimization, that's your organic rankings that appear in Google, uh, generally below the adverts and sort of to the left of adverts on the right hand side. Uh, this is free in essence. So the better we write our content on our website, the better we tailor it to Google's algorithm, better we tailor it to our audiences, the more likely our, our visibility on Google is going to be ranked. So we want to aim for at least number three position for a key search term. If we're not number three or higher, we're not really visible. There's not really much point. Okay, so we need to think about ways in which we can uh, formulate strategies to uh, formulate tactics, sorry, uh, to, to uh, get up in our organic rankings. On the flip side, we have pay per click. If we are struggling for a particular term, um, like red trainers, for example, we may struggle because it's a really broad match term. We're, we're battling with the likes of Nike and Adidas and Puma and all these huge companies, which we can't even begin to compete with them. Um, so um, we can advertise, so we can bid on our adverts to get visible uh, on the right hand side and at the top of Google. So if our SEO is not working, then we can use um, PPC, okay? Do, in digital marketing and digital business, we wanna try and do everything as free as possible and as cheap as possible. The less outgoings, the more revenue and the more, the more income we're gonna get, um, sorry, the more profits we're gonna get at the end, okay? So we have PPC, pay-per-click advertising, SEO, search engine optimization. We also have digital PR. Um, so we can, like with influencer marketing, we can leverage journalists and we can leverage um, PR people out on the online uh, that can do all the legwork for us. We need to create a series of press releases uh, um, about our product uh, and look at trends in the news, look at what's coming up. Um, the trends in technology and things like that. How can we write valuable content which somehow injects our products into that? So it's not a it's not a hard sell about our products. Again, uh, we are inject. Oh, this is one particular solution that that problem in the news has presented. Okay, we're writing it in that way that is providing value to the customer. Uh, if we're providing finding value, you're most likely to get further purchases. So the digital PR agencies can be a way to do that. They have online press releases. They can do events, uh, emails for you online events like webinars and things like that. Um, if we get journalists and PR companies on site, um, we, can, we can leverage their knowledge in terms of promotion um, and um, they can effectively do our job for us. Um, and the beauty of online PR is it's global. So if we're trying to hit a new market in India, for example, we can hit PR people in India much easier. We can send them documents, send them whatever it is, press releases, all sorts of stuff. Whereas before, we'd need to go visit India, hand them a press release or whatever it is, and then go through it that way. So, so this can be a way uh, to, to promote your product. Social media, of course, I think I've covered it in a great amount of detail. Um, I'm just gonna look at the notes, see if there's anything else. Um, but yeah, I think I've covered this in a huge amount of detail. We need to think about our social media, make sure it's uh, effective and efficient for us as a digital business owner. Make sure you're using the right channels. Uh, hitting the right people at the right time. 
by interest-based interest marketing uh, and you should be able to be effective with all of those. Innovation. Uh, innovation is sort of democratized across the web. Uh, we can utilize um, models such as crowdsourcing or open innovation to leverage uh, the knowledge, the skills, and the expertise of people outside of our organization and bring them in to our organization and create value that way. Um, we can run a, a video creation innovation uh, competition. For example, we can set that up online and we can say, oh, the incentive is, you know, you'll get a lifetime supply of our products, for example, in return for, for this. So what you do is you get a ton of people submitting their ideas and their videos and all that stuff to your particular challenge. And then you can just select which one you like the best. So instead of going out to agencies, this may charge you tens of thousands of pounds for a video or thousands of pounds for a video. Instead, you go out to your customers, which already know what they want from you. They're, they're designing content that they want to see. So you're utilizing their content, bringing it into your business. It reduces your time and your effort. All you need to do is select the winner and that's all you need to do. Um, so what an, another benefit of what that does as well, it enables uh, you to have a rapport with that, with that particular customer. That customer, as soon as their video gets chosen, they become a brand ambassador for you. They're a loyal customer through and through and they will do then mark your marketing for you. They will advertise for you because they love your brand so much that they wanted to uh, invest time to submit into a competition. This is a way you can do it. So a lot of a lot of people are a lot of companies are doing it. Lego did it for a while, where you could go on and design your own Lego set, and then you like on a three D kind of modeling thing, and then you can and then you can order that exact set. Um, Procter and Gamble do it. They've been doing it since two thousand and one. Really, really, really effectively. Um, new products and services, um, they just put call out, get people to submit those ideas to it. And then what happens is Procter & Gamble, for those that um, are successful, they'll, they'll pay for all the marketing and promotion, everything around it. And then that, that inventor, that whoever they were, entrepreneur, they get, to, they get a percentage of return of the sales from now for the next 10 years or something. Okay, it depends. It depends on the products and service. But yeah, so open innovation, crowdsourcing uh, can be ways of doing it. Um, if you want more information about that, I'm sure you can ask me questions about it later or you can do a Google, as we all do, uh, and you can do it that way. Data-driven business. One of the beautiful things about being online is we have a huge amount of data. Everything is recorded. Everything in transaction, everything we're doing online is recorded. Um, obviously, that has its ethical implications in terms of uh, whether people want uh, data shared and things like that. You know, people can set up private private browsing sessions and things like that through incognito. Um, but in general, we have all this data at our fingertips as business owners, as marketers, um, and we can utilize that within our digital business. So what that does enables us to create a data-driven strategy. The more data we inject into our business, the more streamlined we can make our business and the better decisions we're gonna make at the end of the day. The better decisions we wanna make, what that's gonna do is reduce cost and reduce the amount of labor associated with um, with running your business. So the more data we collect, the better it is going to be for our business in the end of the day. Um, in an offline environment, you know, we might need to go out and physically collect that data. In an online environment, with things like Google Analytics, Yahoo Web Analytics, Facebook Insights, the data is already there. It's just telling us. It's telling us exactly what works, what doesn't work. We just need to look at that in greater detail and make sure um, we're imp uh, implementing that within our uh, digital business. So uh, I think the final section I'm going to go through is opting for optimization. Uh, so again, um, referring to the hands-off method, as hands-off as we possibly can, we want to make sure that all of our features, our products, our processes, our practices, everything we're doing is as optimized as possible. If it's optimized, then it will be efficient and effective and you won't really need to get involved that much anymore. So First thing I'm going to ask is, what is A-B testing? Nothing so far, Gareth. <sighs> Not hearing crickets, are we? Oh, here we go. Um, Malavia says, comparison of two options, Pamela. 
to see what you can find. <laughs> and uh, Kemi is saying comparing two versions of an app. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Those those are good answers. Yes. And so, what A/B testing generally does, um, it tests one variable. Um, so, so for example, if we have two adverts, okay, and we change one thing about that advert, okay, maybe it is the color of the button, okay, it could be something as simple as that. We want to change one variable at a time, okay, to be able to test uh, that in the in in real terms. Generally, what we'll do is we'll send 50% of our customers, our users, one advert, 50% another advert, and we can directly compare which one is more effective. We run it for maybe a week, maybe two weeks, maybe a month, however you want to set it for, and we can analyze that data and say, okay, green buttons generally work better for us. We'll go for green. We have that data to back it up. We know that it's more efficient and effective. There we go. Move on to the next variable. And we want to do this as many times as we can. The more times we do this, the more optimized we are based on data. We're backed up by data every single process of the, of the way. We, we don't want to go out guessing and just Googling and hoping that market research is going to tell us uh, the information that exactly want to do because it may, may not necessarily be relevant or um, valuable to your business. We want to test it out in the real world uh, and A-B testing is a very short and efficient way of doing that. Okay, so we have a control. Uh, and we have a variation and we test them against each other. That's what A-B testing is. Through A-B testing, as a result, we can do, we can, uh, do social media optimization. Uh, we can run one advert on Facebook um, against another advert uh, and we can see which one works best. Maybe we change the text slightly in one of them. Maybe the images are exactly the same or uh, everything else is exactly the same, uh, but we can streamline our social media posting and advertising um, a lot more efficient and effectively by doing A-B testing. Okay, and we should be able to do this on, I think we can do it on most of our plat uh, platforms that have advertising features on it. Um, you can advertise to 50% of your audience, generally around 50% because so you get an even more even spread, the data will be more realistic that way. Um, in terms of our design on our website, um, we can do A-B testing this way. Uh, so for exam example, the layout, uh, we can show 50% of our audience one layout, 50% another layout, and we can literally un better understand which works better, which works better for us. Uh, again, buttons, color, even the font can make a big difference. Uh, even placement where it is on the website can make a big difference. Um, uh, landing pages, you know, if people come from a social media ad or uh, search engine optimization or uh, a Google ad, whatever it is, uh, and they come onto a particular landing page, we can send 50% of their audience to one, 50% of an audience to another version of that landing page, and we can test those in real terms and understand, is our design effective? Is it something about the font? Is it something about the copy, the length of the paragraph? We can test lots and lots and lots of different hypotheses uh, to, to better understand the efficiency and effectiveness of our digital marketing and digital business practices. Content. Uh, so content, we want to optimize this as much as possible, okay? Uh, we want to show, uh, you know, again, we can use A-B testing on our content as well. There's no reason why we can't do that. Um, but also, uh, with regards to uh, specifically with video marketing, which is becoming hugely popular now, we need to think more about video marketing. Um, we need to always think about video marketing, what types of videos we can create, how-to videos are massively, massively popular. Uh, we need to think about the metadata surrounding um, those particular pieces of content. So, uh, for example, with a video on YouTube, uh, we have the description, uh, which lays out, we have the title itself, um, and we also have different hashtags and stuff that we can put in as well. Um, links within the description, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, make a big difference to how, how visible the content is firstly, and how valuable the content is. Okay, so we may want to tweak things within our content, uh, encourage customer feedback on our video, um, maybe send it out through a nurture campaign, this is our video, see what the response is like, maybe send 50% of people another video, um, a different video, and then you can A-B test in that way. Maybe the creative isn't quite uh, linking up with, it, uh, with, what the, with the customer psyche, maybe they're not quite engaged with that, uh, with that particular piece of content as they perhaps they should be. And conversion rate optimization as well. This is, this is a big thing. So we want to make sure that our payment processes are as efficient and as effective as possible. 
we want to go if once people get onto our website we want to make the shortest leap to that payment process how quickly can them can they buy that product for example if they click on a google ad they go to a landing page and they can buy the product on that landing page there's no reason why we need to make it a longer process tell them more about the information if they're ready to buy they're ready to buy you can, you can always you can always say oh you can read them read more or here's a video uh, that tells you more about that product and things like that you have a an engaged and a captive audience that you already know wants that thing because they click they click through from that advert you know that they're looking for that particular thing if we refer back to 0.05 percent of people clicking through these ads we know that that person because there's so few of them we know that that person is actually looking for that product if we don't supply that product in our landing page there's a disconnect between that advert and that landing page so what that does yeah, that actually um, affects our quality score on Google and then actually reduces our rankings overall. Uh, so conversion rate optimization, as efficient, as effective as possible, and the shortest gap between entering the website and making a purchase. That's what we want to do. So in essence, once we've done all that, uh, you won't ever be done with that because there's infinite amount of things you can test and check. Um, but customer journey optimization is what we want to do. Remember, I was referring to you know how many touch points people are going from. So we need to make sure that they're, they're of course they're they're enabled to go to as many touch points as possible. But we want to get them to purchase as quickly as possible. Maybe do it within a few touch points instead of ten or twenty. We want to make it as efficient as possible. The more efficient they are, uh, our channels are. Uh, through uh, content and through social media optimization, um, we can actually make the customer journey a lot shorter and a lot quicker to um, generate that business for us uh, in a more efficient and effective way. So, finally, I'm just going to talk about the course uh, that we're going to have in digital business at the University of the West Indies. Um, it's not fully mapped out on exactly what is going to be included, but this is just a flavour of what's going to be included. So a digital business course at University of West Indies. Some of the modules that are likely to be part of it, firstly is to understand digital business, what are the facets and what are the pros and cons of digital business. We need to understand strategy and how it's different in an online environment. I'm sure I've covered that in a little bit of way here. I've touched upon that. We need to drill down the details of strategy, maybe using the SOSTAC model as a way to efficiently create a cyclical uh, model of, of data and testing and, and tracking and and make sure our objectives and our goals are aligned to that strategy. Looking at the web technologies, what's the um, latest things that are out there that we can leverage as digital entrepreneurs. Looking at the people involved, the online entrepreneur, what do you need to know and how do you need to know those, find out those things in order to become a digital business owner. And another one is online consumers because, you know, as I talked about, the customer journey has massively changed. We need to drill down into creating customer personas and making sure that those uh, customer personas are targeted and as specific as possible with our products. We need to know exactly who those people are in order, uh, in before we even start doing anything. We need to know our target audiences specifically by creating target personas. Uh, there's a certain level of interactivity. Uh, generally, when I'm, I teach in person, there's a certain media, there's interactive sessions and there's group work and things like that as well. It's not so easy in this environment, unfortunately, uh, but yes, there'll be the use of media, use of interactive sessions. You'll have to get, get hands on with the technology. Uh, there'll be group work sessions and there'll be uh, enterprise sessions as well in terms of we flesh out a business model and make sure we're answering as many questions as we possibly can. Um, and maybe at the end of the course, you'll have a, a functional business model that could be turned into a successful online business. Uh, one of the outcome, the outcome primarily would be to know how to build and launch a strong online business and that would be my uh that would be my goal for all the students or the participants on that course at that particular time so final question want to study digital business <laughs> it's a heavy weighted question i think <laughs> i'm anticipating the responses and we have capitalized from nicole saying yes with an exclamation mark and i am anticipating that the other 62 participants are also saying yes to that. Let's let's hope so. Yes. <laughs> confirmed, Gareth. Confirmed. 
Yes, 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 yes. And they're asking, when can we start? So we're going <laughs> to get some more details about that shortly. Excellent. I something? Yes, Gareth. That, so, well, that's good to know. That, that'll be uh, very embarrassing if it was a resounding no, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Definitely anyway. no no's here. <laughs> Good, good. Well, Jennifer, we're going to speak about that a little later. She was asking about the prerequisites, but we can also send you some follow-up information. We're going to be sending out as part of the wrap-up for this session, some other information on how you can get in contact with us. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Sonia. That's great. Um, so yes, just to kind of, in the final section, I'm just going to summarize, um, take any comments from people or anything like that, any, any questions you might have uh, in just a second uh, in the question and answer session. Uh, so yeah, just to summarise, of course this isn't goodbye, hopefully we'll see you again uh, for the, uh, the short courses um, in digital business that we're going to rerun in next year. So we've ran through why we should do digital business, hopefully that I've covered that in a reasonable amount of detail. Of course, uh, in the longer course I'll drill down a bit deeper into that. Uh, the web and people and how they interact with each other and why it's kind of like a marriage of people together. It's a marriage of the technology with the people. Um, Digital business models, I've gone through a flavor of different digital business models uh, that we can use um, and uh, that we can leverage. There's many, many more out there, of course, but these are the kind of the, the fundamental ones that we can leverage. The tech and app web applications associated with setting up a digital business. Uh, the strategy channels and innovation practices we can leverage in terms of gathering data and making sure our um, data and ideas and making sure our uh, practices are as efficient and effective as possible. And we've gone through various different ways in which you can optimize our digital business uh, to make sure it's as efficient and effective as possible in terms of achieving our goals, whatever they may be. So yes, finally, uh, just going to finish up with taking any questions that anyone may have about digital business or digital marketing, if you'd like. Well, there are lots of some questions about the courses and so on, some of which I'll address just in the wrap up. So I yep. will ask your question. But if there are any specific questions for Gareth right now about the content that we would have been exposed to today, and we do have one from Ian asking, where is AI, where is AI, artificial intelligence in digital business? Where is AI in digital? So, <clears throat> so AI can take many, many, many forms. Um, you know, when you think of artificial intelligence, a lot of people think like, you know, these are robots and things like that. However, there's many, many different pieces of AI. So for example, when I talked about automation, that is a version of artificial intelligence. It's a, it's a formatted uh, process that's, uh, that's done by a machine in an automated way. Uh, it's not necessarily thinking of itself. However, it can produce content in a tailored, and, uh, a tailored way in order to better fit that target segment. Uh, so for example, uh, if we're using something like Salesforce, we can pre-segment our audiences by demographic, by gender, by whatever, whatever it is we want to do. And then the machine takes over that process. Oh, this email needs to go to here. This email needs to go to here. This email needs to go to here. Um, so we're segmenting our audiences and providing the correct content to the correct people at the correct time and hopefully in the correct place as well. So that's where artificial intelligence can fit, can fit in. I'm sure there's many different ways that artificial intelligence can be roped in as well. Machine learning can be utilized as well. Um, so uh, yes, I mean, there's, there's many ways, uh, but that's just one example that I covered today of how AI fits in. Okay, so I'm not seeing any other questions at the moment. We'll just give you a few seconds to type that burning question. Um, if you do have one, uh, the questions that we do have about the course and what comes next, there are different iterations that we will have on offer from the Department of Management Studies, as well as the Center for Professional Development and Lifelong Learning. So I'll show you some of what is coming up through CPDLL. But the course is going to, the digital marketing course is offered at our postgrad level and it can run the breadth of the semester. We'll be working out the timing and so on of that. I will get back to you once we have that all in place. The course may have a flexible format, and it all depends really on when we are looking to offer it. Uh, we do have three semesters running in the graduate program. Semester one will be the traditional, semester one and two will be the traditional um, months, but we do have a semester three which runs in summer, so it depends on where we place it on the calendar. And de uh, determining whether it's going to be run online or not, again, uh, we know we are going to have flexible uh, delivery mechanisms, 
but whether this particular one will be online is something that we'll be sorting out in the near future and we will be able to give you more information later on. We also had a question about the recording for this session. There's keen interest there as well, Gareth. We do make the recording available on our Facebook page for CPDLL, but if uh, we are going to be sending you an email for your feedback on this session, and we also allow you to let us know if you prefer to get a link to the recording rather than visiting our Facebook page. But we invite you to visit our Facebook page. There's a lot of thought that went into developing it, as well as to provide you with the content, um, with, the, with the content that you will find most useful to you. And I'm just getting a message here. Um, yes, we may, we may be running digital marketing soon. And I know the slides coming up once we close off this session will show you uh, the offerings through CPDLL that we have with digital marketing. And there are no further questions here, Gareth. Any last comments from you? Um, gosh. Uh, so, I mean, I hope you all enjoyed uh, this webinar. Um, as, as you can see, there's a lot of different facets and features to setting up a digital business. Uh, I mean, we haven't even sort of begun to think about how we might get started. Of course, we've thought about the wider concepts and the wider technologies and things that we can implement, the wider strategies, but we need to, you know, in the, in the, in the, short, in the short course, uh, the, well, the longer course from this, uh, we can um, think about how specifically we can do those things, what actions we can take in order to build up that business and hopefully uh, we'll um, get something online for you. Okay, well, thank you so much, Gareth. Like, you said, like we said at the beginning, you're no stranger to us and we also, we are always delighted when you can engage with us and our students and now our webinar participants. And I want to thank all of you for being here with us this afternoon. I just want to show you what's coming up next in the series. So if you just bear with me for a couple more moments. This was a five week, a five seminar series in our free webinar series. We wanted to give back to the community and give you a taste, as I said earlier, of what was coming up through CPDLL and on, indeed the offerings at the Department of Management Studies in particular with many of our courses, both at undergraduate and our postgraduate programming. So today's session, you would you just see here at the top, the first three sessions that we had, today's session was with Gareth and our last session is on cybersecurity and that's coming up on uh, next Wednesday, the 24th and that's going to be running from five until 6.30. As I said before, we are going to be sending you the uh, feedback form and you can indicate there if you need a direct link, but the recording will be, the recording for this session will be on uh, our Facebook, our CPDLL Facebook page. Uh, just one moment. So you can see, <laughs> my mouse is playing tricks with me. So you can see what's coming up next. So as I said, we wanted to give you opportunities to retool, re-equip, or just envisage uh, some other competencies and skills that you can build, particularly as we were in the COVID lockdown and it was giving you exposure to some content that you may not have thought of before. It also is a marketing tool to see what, you, what could garner your interest in line with what we have on offer as short courses through the CPDLL. So as you can see, we are having digital marketing. I think that may be coming up in October, but we will send out the schedule. We'll be sending out the schedule shortly so that you can see uh, when those courses are. You're also free to, and I'm just highlighting here, contact us at the CPDLL, and you will see the website, which is our KFIL domain, or KFIL URL, lifelong-learning, or you can engage with us on any of the social media platforms that you see here, or don't hesitate to send an email to cpdll at kfil.ue.edu and the telephone numbers that you see here as well. You would have received an email invite to this webinar and you are free to respond to Ronaldo. He is uh, an employee within the CPDLL and he'll get back to you as soon as possible as well. And yes, Rachel, the recordings for the past three webinars should be available on our Facebook page. So without further ado, again, let me thank you, Gareth, for spending time. And good evening. I think it's uh, almost nightfall there in the UK. <laughs> yeah, Five hours ahead. <laughs> Is the sun still up because we're heading into summer? 
It's the UK. It never. It was never sunny here. <laughs> They will yeah, not tease you with what the weather looks like here <laughs> and the beautiful beaches which you are with, with which you are very familiar. A balmy day here in BIM, with beautiful cumulus clouds in the deep, deep cauliflower blue skies above your favorite beach just below the university. But I won't tell you any of that. Of no, you'll be back shortly. So again, wonderful having you with us, Gareth. And yes, there are several courses that Gareth does engage with us through um, the department, both the Department of Management Studies with our academic programming, as well as our professional programming here through the CPDLL. So thank you so much uh, for being with us this afternoon. And we look forward to engaging with you as we, part of the University of the West Indies Cayfield campus, help shape your future. Good evening, everybody. Good afternoon, everyone.